Hey everybody, I'm Sean Robinson. And I'm Carson Grubaugh. Welcome to Living the Line. Living the Line. Today I'm like, Living the Line. <laughs> like three months from now, we're just, <laughs> we get deeper every time. <laughs> <laughs> Today we're going to be talking about a book called Apollo's Song. Yeah. <laughs> this is a book to get your Barry White voice out for, for sure. <laughs> It's true. Uh, it is definitely true. Uh, there is an awful lot of sex in, in this book um, <laughs> and a, a small percentage of it, um, human beings. Uh, I think that that's a, a safe thing. So if that's too much of a spoiler for you, don't watch any further. Um, so, so Carson, um, we've been talking about doing this book for a while, but I didn't realize that uh, they have, that there's a new edition of this book and it has a dog of a cover there yeah. will you hold yours up real quick so we can see it <clears throat> it, so this it the... feels really nice though it's on this kind of nice plasticky like textured thing so it okay. feels nice uh we should have scanned maybe afterwards we can both scan a page and compare what the insides look like because i know you complain that they everyone always does tezuka bad but this looks pretty good to me so i'm curious oh, really? about that but yeah let's be see very your, curious let's see your cover yeah so this cover by the imitable chip kid just absolutely slays me so we've got this yellow well, this this real nice primary um and and the black so the image is still bold of this uh woman and this is the primary um I mean, almost like antagonist. It's really weird to say that, but yeah. Um, and then this is our our main character with both the like horrid, he's you know, horrified but also obsessive. So we pick, he's picked these perfect images. He's offset them with color, and then to the the chef's kiss here is the obi. It's printed on this thing so that you, as the reader, must pull this off to reveal her nudity, which is oh. otherwise obscured perfectly by this. Um, you know, lusting but horrified face. It just, it I just was, kills me. I was going to complain about that because Chip Kid did that on the Tezuka Buddha books too. And okay. you know, I hate dust covers. And so this is like a, a third <laughs> of a dust cover. And like, I get that it has like interactive meaning, but I hate having those things on my bookshelf. <laughs> it looks, I, I, it looks nice, but. I just love this. And I, I, I love the aspect that you have to be compelled to remove her clothing yourself and that your cl or the clothing is the, you know, the character's face. His uh, not story. that I've actually done this myself. I just, it's just an intriguing little, little thing there. Um, I've had this since it first came out in 2007, uh, which you can tell I used to store it uh, right up against the window. You can see that the yellow has now turned to uh, oh. uh, uh, almost off yellow here and then right here on the edge almost white where it's gotten yeah. like double exposure for different places it was uh, uh stored whereas the blue and the sort of magenta are basically the same color this is one of those things we talked about it in a different video yeah you know, the um, peaks, peaks that you did exactly i did some unintentional peaks tonization here uh <laughs> but uh this book what a wild book i'm glad it's still in print um but <laughs> yeah, it just got the, the one I've got is it it just got redone and it's from Kodansha, which I guess vertical, which is the one that you have is a, now a subsidiary of Kodansha. Okay. I don't it know why they time. changed like you've got Chip Kid doing a cover. I don't know why they changed it. Um, yeah, I'd be interested. Maybe his contract was only for a certain amount of time or something. That yeah. seems like a silly thing to do for a book, a book design. But uh, yeah, who knows? Yeah, but it, I'm glad because we've been talking about it and it gave me a chance to grab the book and buy it. Um, yeah, and it's 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 an interesting book. So I say we just like jump into it. Let's do it. Pick it apart as we go. Well, and he, he sort of jumps right into the story too, right? I mean, good God. I don't know if I've ever seen an opening page. <laughs> <laughs> the opening sequence me. is pretty intense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just this this whole sequence here reminds me of that uh sequence in the ink call where they're all rushing up to like they're having a battle to get to the queen the like right. new queen lady um all 500 million of us will race to the death to reach our one and only queen 
All but one lucky winner will perish. The odds are 500 million to one. Ready? Go! <laughs> well, n- naked man standing on top of a crowd with his ding dong out. <laughs> right. And basically the crowd all looks not identical, but very, very similar. Yeah, pretty much the same. Uh, and then you get like, I mean, he wasn't messing around in terms of details on these pages. No. <laughs> and then we got this crowd rushing. And if you don't notice from the tube here, um, from this uh, <clears throat> cave that they're passing yeah. through, you'll probably notice by the egg that she's uh, got as a sort of halo around her, um, that these are personified sperm. Yeah, what the analogy <clears throat> here is uh that cracked me up and then it looked like there's like this was in color originally because there's yeah like an ink wash look to a lot of it mm-hmm. that's that's strange and then here's <laughs> yeah all the dead sperm men all the all the the failed warriors as peter o'toole said in his uh his autobiography um when I oh, what's the exact line? Something about um, I think about how many Mozarts I've held in my hand and washed down the drain. Oh Jesus Christ! <laughs> <laughs> none, none. It's all potential. Um, and then like you know, I he's he's made it. Oh, this is funny too, where his little tail flops off. Yeah, yeah. He's made it like I don't know. You don't even see tails anywhere else. I don't think it's all just like dudes running up a cave, which you get right. the idea. But then he goes and like has the tail pop off and like, oh yeah, it's actually a sperm. And it's like, why didn't you just draw sperm? (laughs) (laughs) It's kind of funny. But that queen lady is important because she's the, she seems kind of like that personification of the antagonist that you're talking about. Yeah. Um, And, and uh, you can see, you know, Tezuka's uh, medical background and his concerns with uh, medical issues. We get a basically anatomically correct uh, what do you call it? fertilized egg growing into a uh, fetus with a few other animals there as well, uh, not even mammalian ones. And the embryo, a miniature of evolution, an organism's past and future, its ending and beginning. Yeah, I like Which, that, that he's like the embryo is kind of because that's one theory, right? It goes through like, here's a salamander, here's the rat, here's, you know, that it evolves right. in the womb. Um, and then he gets some real big statement about the natural divide between male and female. And I thought, right. oh, that, I'm surprised they didn't edit that out these days. <laughs> <laughs> nature was well, the whole, the whole intent of the story. And he's given us the thesis right here in the first 14 pages, nature yeah. divides us into male and female. We come together and create offspring for posterity. As long as the world exists, men, women, and the children they bear will repeat this endless drama day after day. Yeah. Um, I really wonder if this is really the first installment or uh, whether this was sort of added after the fact, but it's, it really caps off the whole thing and gives you a flavor of what you're going to be looking at. So this was in 1970. uh, And uh, one of the things to bear in mind when you're reading this book is that uh, Tezuka was an intensely competitive person and it wasn't enough for him to be basically the biggest comic artist in the world he also wanted to be the top of every single genre. And uh, by 1970, that means that he had dealt with, um, you know, 10 to 15 years of seeing this Gekiga and getting this idea that, you know, people were talking about him as sort of passe in a certain respect, um, or at least that was his sort of feeling about it, is that there's this, you know, young, <laughs> young, uh, young kids uh, doing this edgy kind of stuff that has some element of psychological realism and stuff like that. And so this is really an attempt by him to get an edge in that market. And so, you know, some of the stuff like setting at a psych hospital, um, you know, some of that, I think, is a, an attempt to pitch this at that audience. Well, just taking on like a serious theme that it's, it's, I don't know if this was intended to be an ongoing series or not because of some of the back and forth, but it seems like a pretty focused planned. Here's the nugget. That was the date was really impressing me because it's like that's 1970. And we keep talking about like how we feel Japan was kind of ahead of the curve. I know some of our viewers have questioned that, but you know, looking at uh, Eisner's contract with God was what 78. Right. 
So, I mean, just to think that there's these 500 page graphic novels being made already. It's like, my yeah. God, you know, I know we had reasons, you know, that we're right. holding our industry back, but it's, it's really impressive to see from that standpoint. Uh, yeah. So this, this guy right here is our uh, main character. It's really difficult to say that he's like the protagonist in a sort of traditional sense, because, you know, you really don't empathize with him for a long period of time. Yeah. And um, I think it's safe to say that he has his psychological malady um, is a sort of lack, like a horror, horrifying lack of empathy. Um, you know, you might call him like psychopathic or whatever, but he's getting shock treatment um from this doctor and this doctor doesn't believe that he's a psychopath this doctor believes that his basically his trauma and his youth has created him in him a horror of love uh, yeah when he's he, getting yeah he does abhor love he hates love he hates seeing people be in love and he wants to like hurt them and stuff um that seems to be the big trigger for his ill behavior is love Right. Seeing people in love makes me sick. That's all. Yeah. Uh, so he's he's been shocked and he has this confrontation with a personification of a deity. So he's like in a temple um, and uh, shows, <laughs> is this not the woman who made thee thus? Look well and remember, I know who that is. It's my mother. <laughs> I'm just I'm just glad he didn't yell. Oh, go hoosh. <laughs> <laughs> just a little shazam power uh, uh so i, I gotta ask you if they fix the typos here uh carson what, what is so the typo? on page 25 there is it say is this not is the is uh have have the um what type of i is it there it's a capital like yeah. a i i yeah this is one of those things that like once you've learned a certain level of digital lettering it's just going to irritate you every time <laughs> you look at unprofessionally lettered stuff yeah so, it's it's strange because like if we look at uh okay let's look at these two pages like this one has the capital i don't seeing people in love has the lowercase sick yeah. has the lowercase which is all appropriate in it i idea like that's all good but in this it has uh the it's also has the capital i don't know yeah if yours has it's that. It's because some whoever typed the script wasn't doing the lettering themselves, and they typed the script with a capital letter there because in normal functioning, you use a capital on the fr front of the sentence. But in, uh, you know, American cartoon conventions, <laughs> uh, you, you don't use a, an I with, the, with the, uh, the lines on the top and the bottom unless it's I referring to I as a person. Yeah, I, I'll, I'm... Which Things was like one that. of the one of the keys and strange stuff of Alex Raymond for me too that like made me go okay maybe Do Dave's not crazy about uh, um, his idea that Ward Green had the the two dots Ellipsis. because there's a thing where they're talking about eyes but it's like why in the hell would it have a dot above a capital I and then you start combining the comics lettering and the whole thing just got weird yeah um, yeah I so, didn't notice that that's funny because you've been doing a lot more lettering right. Yeah. And after you do a couple hundred pages, it's like you just that type of stuff just jumps right out of you. Well, this book is littered with those uh, wow. those types of things that drive me crazy. But um, yeah, in front of her anytime it isn't. Yeah. Yep. I didn't notice in front. that. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's OK. Uh, I really like this page here just yeah. where he shrinks down and then it shows up on the next page. It's like uh, him teleporting into this baby kind yeah. of. That's a really cool formal. So he gets like basically reborn, right? Like in mm -hmm. this. Or wait, no, this, this is him going back to his youth. Yeah. So experiencing so, his trauma. Right. We we get a we get a like uh relationship with his trauma, which basically involves his him walking in on his mother with various people and her promiscuity and withholding love from him all of which were sort of things that were sort of taken for granted as um, normal <laughs> philosophical or not philosophical, but psychological trauma type things, um, you know, through the fifties, sixties and seventies, this yeah. is a kind of a Freudian explanation for, um, you know, psychological abnormality. Yeah. And then he sees like the birds in love protecting their babies 
and he just gets super mad about that and has to go squish the birds because it's like my mother didn't do that and didn't protect me and you you start to see like oh dude this kid's like this dude's messed up right and yeah it's it's hard to imagine i always kind of play this game with tezuka like imagining what it would be like to more realistically render some of these things uh I, well, like that's a little bit more. The bird's a little cartoon. Oh yeah, it, soup. That that's a no. That's a fantastic one right there. But I mean, like killing the bird and things like that. Um, I, I I think if you were to make this in a fairly realistic style, I don't think you'd depict the actual killing of the animals. Uh, if you wanted people to to keep reading. <laughs> well, I feel like the other Gekiga stuff. I mean, they they draw more cartoony, but I feel like they would have got more visceral and nasty. It's right. one of the things that's interesting about a lot of the Tezuka work that we've looked at is he will take on like super intense um, in, in the other one we we're looking at too, the Phoenix, there's some like, oh, just yeah. throw the baby off the cliff. And right. it, it all looks like a Disney movie. And so like that friction actually makes it more intense for me sometimes. Because mm -hmm. it's like if you saw Bambi get like murdered, I know, I know Bambi's sure. dad gets murdered but like if it was more visceral um i i just knew you were going to flag that <laughs> that page there <laughs> it's so strange because when i do see the realistic stuff i'm used to seeing uh him do, I, i'm used to seeing his assistants do nature i'm not used mm -hmm. to seeing tezuka like usually if he does backgrounds it's kind of like this thing here like right. the buildings are a little more cartoony too so it's very strange um, to see like man-made stuff rendered so realistically but now he's been like shocked again or he's fallen through mm -hmm. i don't know it gets a little hard to follow like he has another encounter with this deity and she reincarnates him in uh, nazi germany <laughs> and this is where the book gets weird to me especially because i think i had read up to this point uh, and then like oh, i had to go to bed and so i came back this day and i was like what the hell did i like, miss something <laughs> yeah we're in a war story now like i didn't realize this was a collection of stories but that's the form that this takes is now this character gets like teleported into all these alternate realities where he has to encounter the the basically they're trying to make him feel love over and over again and then deprive him of it to cure him right and was your impression uh at this stage in the book that this is a hallucination or this is um, something that the doctor is doing to him while he's under hypnosis or shock shock treatment or did you did you accept the the spiritual or the psycho the the um, my mystical explanation at its face value at the start at first i didn't even tie this character because i did like read this much and then stop for the day okay. and go to bed I didn't even realize it was this character because you know me I'm pretty gotcha. bad about names ex especially when they're foreign names um it took me a minute to be like wait this is that Shogo guy again gotcha. and then I kind of went back and looked and it was like okay well the doctor shocked him and this is like a hallucination he's having while he's gotcha. being shocked um, yeah and 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 there's some evidence early on that that could be the case like the doctor's you know playing with the watch when he wakes up and you know, gives him a little brief tutorial on um, hypnosis and stuff like that. But well, I mean, and he, it's he played more straight. Explicitly, he more explicitly hypnotizes him in the second or third one that they send him to. He's like, okay, we're going to hypnotize you now. Right. So, um, but, but as far as how it's played as a comic, I mean, it's played totally straightforward. Like this is what's happening. Yeah. So he's a, he's a soldier and he's a conscript in the German army and he's a, you know, a, a told he's told that he's got to, um, um, you know, watch this train of people depart, depart and uh, get him onto another train. And he wants to save this girl who's like heart, his face kind of like reaches into him, you know. Um, yeah, and he says and, those prisoners are Jews. No falling in love with them. Interesting, by the way, this Nazi's got a pig face. Right. Mm, <laughs> yeah, <I'm not> <laughs> seen that before. <laughs> And here's another example of like, okay, here's a train crashing full of Jewish prisoners. And he's got this super cartoony, like doink dive, run for cover. Right. <laughs> uh, weird combination. But yeah, he's, he's fallen in love with this Jewish prisoner. 
Yeah, man. I, I really it, during that's the other thing. Like they're on a Nazi prison train, and his his buddies making fun of him for having an erection the whole <laughs> time. And then here's this shadow. Like he's got his gun, but it's like it's a gun boner. Um, it, it's just he's such a Tezuka's such a just. It feels like he's making everything up on the fly, and it always makes just for really uncomfortable. It's a style I I still I enjoy, but I don't know what to do with it, honestly. Like you're in the middle of this Nazi story, and then you're like, oh, let's do a gun boner, like because that's <laughs> what came to mind. Yeah, well, I I it, I I think that uh you know one of the explanations we came through with on Phoenix is just how much of a showboat and a you know storyteller he is. I just think that he's like continually trying to hook his his audience um using everything that he's got. He's like he's the guy who tap dances while he's um while he's playing the guitar and holding something on his chin at the same time, you know. Yeah, and also it just feels like he's making it up as he goes. Like he knows generally what he wants to do, but he's doing like 20 pages a day and he's just winging it. And so that like back and forth, like his own entertaining nature sometimes takes over in the hustle, you know? And then it's right. like, oh, wait, 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 we're doing like a serious war story. Okay, we got to kill everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... um you know, you don't have to know the details to know that they're totally doomed, exactly like he has been cursed by this uh, Apollo figure to be. Um, or not, I suppose it's not, it's just no, the temple he's, of Apollo. He's like Apollo. I never figured out exactly what the Apollo song, I mean, I know he's supposed to be Apollo somehow, but I don't know what that had to do with anything. <laughs> oh, I thought that, yeah, okay, well, let's maybe we'll come to that at the end. But Because Apollo is like a male, I don't know. Right, uh, the you have the, de the deity or whatever at the at the at the temple has cursed him uh, allegedly to keep on repeating the same things over and over again, and, and um, specifically that he'll never be able to hold on to or grasp love. He'll have love that can never be fully consummated. Yeah, um, and that's and this here. Is, he he's back in the. This is where I finally figured out what was going on back in the loony bin like oh you bastards you're making me feel like this you know right and then the doctor uh, it, comes in and explains the uh the shock treatment right. and the hypnosis w would you go to 78 real quick um there's there's a uh, two panels on there that i really love the first one there with his you know his rigor mortis hand um straight up and the, the butterflies just kind of fluttering by and then the one with his you know dead eyes at the top there um with the field of flowers and the hay i just thought that those are both really affecting images and then when yeah. you actually see him like taut on the table on the next uh next panel that's a really jarring quite intense image yeah and here they say the shock treatment is over how was it a little stressful so that's where i was like oh okay this yeah. is all they're like zapping his brain and it's causing this is their shock therapy is making him right. relive and then the doctor talks him through it and they they then he goes okay like now look at this little watch swing back and forth and he kind of teleports again and now he's uh, a pilot <laughs> right this was though a really wild one uh he's a pilot who ends up on a beach with this nurse who you know the, the island they crash land on all of the creatures are uh, totally passive and he thinks oh hey this is going to be easy game and so he beats he goes and beats a rabbit with a stick and kills it uh and then all of the animals uh beat her <laughs> and like bring her to the edge of death uh in retaliation um that big old that's where with... his sorry go ahead no, just the big old it's with the uh, incorrect eye on there. And like you got <laughs> Moomin in there. Yep, I noticed that. <laughs> but this is where like, okay, you basically got uh, like a Disney bunny. You got Thumper and <laughs> he kills it. <laughs> and then you got all the Disney animals like, yeah, killing this chick. And that's where his stuff really works for me because it, it adds an intensity to it. Like you got yeah. Bambi here looking at this guy with the 
beat to death woman. Uh, I love the hatching here with the white highlights on all the animals uh, when he's got the flame uh, lit. Yeah, and we'll have to maybe compare, like scan this page in because to me it looks pretty well reproduced. I know you feel like it's not. Yeah, all, all the Tezuka stuff that I've seen uh, with a few exceptions uh, seem to me that they've been scanned um, directly to bitmap which is why you get a lot of Moire patterns uh, okay. in them. So um, the, the scans are from a good source. It's just that they did it in a way that's not particularly conducive to really sharp reproduction and messes up the tone. Okay. Yeah, the tone's not great, but... Um, Hopefully. Anyways, this is where we get uh, what I think you were referring to earlier. Right. <laughs> he walks in onto this animal fuck fest um, <laughs> and they're all out is, there together uh, exactly all out in the same that's strange it's so silent not even a bird song oh <laughs> and here, here's like the gazelle and the leopard and whatever the kind of animal that is and the deer and <laughs> my favorite line when he sees the horses, I should never have come here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and then there's like, oh, oh, oh. And like, <laughs> look at the wolves that they're like, <laughs> like the O face. Oh, they're coming so hard. And then he's like, comes back to her like, this is a great idea. What's up? <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. You guys have inspired me. Um, <laughs> he's able to restrain himself. But they have, um, you know, they, they have a, a, a sort of callback to those early crowd scenes. You may be a hotshot photographer with artistic pretensions, but you're still a woman. What's that supposed to mean? Tokyo is full of all kinds of folks, gentlemen and ladies, working stiffs and tenement landlords, photographers like you. But take away their titles, their jobs, and their clothes, and they're all just men and women. But if we're all just men and women, we're not so different from the animals, are we? Like, that's, that's the most... Uh... <laughs> the most like tender come online ever it's like that bloodhound gang song right. you and me baby ain't nothing but animals <laughs> so let's yeah. do it like they do on the discovery channel and here's some more very <laughs> the chicken i just love that yeah and the snakes and the... all curled up the dragonfly yeah and the way they're like so tender i love right. this idea and he says they perform their acts of love with such seriousness they were so earnest it took my breath away. They must know that mating is the major business of creating descendants. I don't know, man. Like, I don't feel <laughs> like when I've seen Discovery Channel videos of animals going at it that there's any kind of love or tenderness or anything. It's it's more just like pure fury, get it done. Like they can't control themselves, rape almost. Like, I don't, it seems like he's romanticizing quite a bit. Yeah, and you could you could wave that away though by saying that this is the this is the special island where everybody stopped hunting and killing each other. Um, so yeah. I I think that the intention here is uh, you're you're right you're totally right and in fact I watched a frog documentary with my uh, four year old son the other day and hearing them say the female has to run away she's trying to get to the big frog who's on the top and has the loudest voice but she has to get by 15 other frogs who'd like to stupa yeah. you know, yeah, like... exactly <laughs> once a um, female has received the male sperm she won't mate with him again until after her baby is born i read somewhere that there are <laughs> male fish that fertilize the female's legs only after she's laid them like oh how considerate he doesn't even hump her he just like jerks off under it it's like they come on and male insects who die after they've delivered their seed like it's this sacred thing uh i found that kind of all cheesy uh, what well, once again in the context of an island where no one kills themselves or k kills each other that is um but then they're having this tropical storm um storms passed you know he's ready for it but no not gonna happen because she's got these connections to her, you know, previous thing. But I love this contemplation he's got of the skull. Um, oh, here, yeah. Yeah. Why do we have to be two sexes to make babies? Why do you think we even have to be male and female? 
which I think is like a much more contemporary question now, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, and like you don't uh, like you could be the, the lonely amoeba doesn't have to do this male and female crap. It divides into two bodies, making more and more amoebas. So I like that question of why sex, because I have thought about that a lot in terms of like we tend to with like a Darwinian theory of evolution, human beings have use that to justify this idea that we're at the top of the evolutionary game right that we've we're the most evolved or something but by darwin's own rules like survival of the fittest is the criteria for like whoever survives longer is the most fit so in my mind like a single cell organism is still the most evolutionarily fit thing on the planet and this argument that like sex was such a great evolutionary invention because it introduces variety and that allows for more evolution, you know, because you're mixing up the genes instead of just cloning them. It like under Darwin's own theory, that kind of falls apart. Like this is the best way to just ensure forever reproduction. R- right. And, and uh, you know, y- you can make the argument too that we're just a vehicle for our cells that are moving around, uh, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah and like like all all told i guarantee we're not like these things will still be here after we're not or right. even if we all die at the same point they were around longer of course yeah so it's so a they very, win. <laughs> yeah like i kind of agree with like the question here is like you know why why did we need to do it this way like what was the thing and the standard answer i think falls apart um yeah. also look at this anatomically correct yeah i'm sure this is straight straight out of a medical textbook that didn't want to show a penis um this is this is you know this is probably the standard i think i've seen this this type of um weird uh genitalia faux genitalia before in a science book that was like you know in the back of the classroom that was you know from the early 70s or late 60s or something it is a strange thing and then like i know i know he had a wife and kids so i know he's not this oblivious to (laughs) no no not at all and then the male shoots the sperm at the egg (laughs) Uh, Uh, i'm too immature to read this book i'm sorry Uh, (laughs) but i mean he really he's taking on such a serious thing but the all the genre vacillation makes it too funny to me i think so then, uh, you know, they're having this conflict and you, you're starting to realize that the um, period is, uh, what would it say, the cycle that he's trapped in, that this is actually very similar in certain respects to that previous uh, one, just as predicted by the temple guard or whatever that deity thing is. Um so yeah, that he's gonna like come to the point where he's actually ready to fall in love and have sex, which is like the way he's gonna break his own cycle is right. to have sex, and it it keeps like being taken away from him. It's like, nope, nope, you're ready to you're ready to do it. Not gonna happen. <laughs> and so they have this disaster, um, but they actually see a boat. Uh, on the horizon and uh, these guys come onto the to the island and you know they get in a fight um because of course they want to kill the animals and are delighted to find out that the animals are so passive and uh, she's shot and he's deprived of getting some nookie again <laughs> and then we're back in the loony bin for a while yeah and um, you can see him start start to pivot here. Uh, I was whenever I see a pivot in his stuff, I'm always really curious about the serialization and like you know, is he going to change magazines? Uh, did he get like a look at the sales record? Would he just get sick of the previous story? But the pivot here seems to be that the guy actually thinks that he's a killer, and we as the reader all of a sudden thinks that he's a killer too. He's getting hit on by this nymphomaniac, uh, self described nymphomaniac, who tries to bed him in the flowers very similar to his dead body in the flowers earlier a little call back there yeah and then we leave the scene uh and she's found dead 
And the supposition as a reader that you have is that he's killed killed her. And then you and see then him he, running. Yeah, he goes on the run. Right. Which is like real world. And this is where I started being, that's where the same thing I wondered is like, like, did he have a plan for this? Because it seems like he kind of makes up one episode and then just goes to the next. And I, I, I feel that way about a lot of his work that I'm just getting jerked around. And some mm-hmm. of the things that I've bought recently, like they don't even end. It's like like the Dororo and the there was another one, the Glass Fortress or something like that. Mm-hmm. They don't even end. You can tell he just petered out or it wasn't selling well. Right. And this starts to have that, yeah, like you're saying, like it's not selling well or it's going to another company. Um, and I start to lose the thread a little bit. It, he, he just skipped uh, one. Oh yeah, sorry, next page, next page. No, you're, you're good, keep on going. Um, this, this car, uh, he, he repeats this uh, for no particular reason other than it's a little clever, it's a clever solution. He repeats this uh, several different times in the book and I, I flagged it each time. Uh, I thought that that was a very interesting, you know, it's just purely spatial, right? There's no other reason for it. Yeah, and they keep the lettering. I, I wonder in Japanese if he flipped the lettering. Probably not because of the long balloons. Yeah, it's it's flipped on a later page, um, but not here. Huh. So it's interesting. Yeah, and then I didn't even note that because it's just like, well, I remember it, but it was like, oh, yeah, you just need to fit it in over there. Okay. <laughs> it's like amazing that's... what you can get away with as a yeah. as a comic artist if you're just assured you know that's the thing is he's always confident he's such a confident artist and you know he's got like such a good team he could just indicate you know here's the temple here's a little doodle you guys you guys do that and he knows it's going to turn out the way that he wants it to you know well and that's um, why even on these stories that kind of meander and go all over the place and I'm i'm bummed when they don't have an ending but it's like I'm along for the ride and that's that entertainer aspect of Tezuka that you keep going back to. Right. It doesn't really matter. Like the confidence and just the great cartooning kind of takes me along no matter what. Right. Uh, He's stolen some ice out of a cave. Oh, this is okay. Yeah. This is where the book got really strange to me because this is real life. uh, Right. This isn't an imagination. So he runs away and he gets picked up by this, this woman who has a runaway right who actually seems to resemble the the image that he's been having in his dreams yeah and And she takes him to the forest and then it seems like she's in some kind of like weird sub dom relationship with him where (laughs) she's like making him run to go get this ice from this cave and then run back before it melts and she's expecting it to melt and there's like he, he's obviously kind of like getting horny over her and then I, I, like, like at some point like she admits to him that whatever story she had been telling him wasn't the actual story that actually she just wanted to train him as a runner right <laughs> just... well and then as we get more revealed you realize oh she works at the hospital that he was at And it's like taking time off from the hospital. Um, And, you know, so does that mean that she was involved? And, you know, if you think all of this is just a fantasy, um, you know, does that mean that she's involved in in the early stages of it too? Was she in the room while he was knocked out? You know? Yeah, we could go back. I mean, that's where this one does feel like he had a a plan, even though it meanders, it does feel like he he had some kind of plan for it. It's just a really strange plan. (laughs) <laughs> she's not depicted there i was just kind of wondering like what you know if it's just a coincidence but but then again the spiritual explanation is that this is a real thing yeah um, this curse here here uh he said i had no idea this was going to be like some crazy manga shush this is no manga uh, <laughs> come on you, you you look like the hero's girlfriend and then they have her look like this for a second i was wondering if you know that's that's yeah. obviously some famous it it is and I, I can almost remember who that is saze son i i it's a it's a four panel strip um it's a, a famous four panel strip that ran for decades and decades but i i don't know enough i just i've seen an excerpt of it somewhere 
um yeah well one of our <laughs> viewers will have to tell us because he does like he has the moomin and he has asterisks and uh, mm -hmm. oblix in another book and he does that uh, i was just unaware um and in his fourth wall breaking he's like one of the few people that gets away with it for me you know it works still and we get that passionate kiss with him all just covered in grime and dirt and i quite love <laughs> And then her old boyfriend shows up. Right. Who's going to have an analog in later uh, portions of the story. Um, yeah. So the old boyfriend is a track runner. <laughs> Whose shirt is this? I'd like to meet him. <laughs> and then he's he uh, runs dude off the cliff. Shogo. In his car. Yeah. And now, uh, now in his, in his like delusion from being like run over and concussed, now he's, now we've switched again to some future, crazy future world in 2030 where like Homo sapiens and Homo lacteus, uh, <laughs> right. now they're synthians, synthetic human beings. That exist together which will be interesting because we're going to talk to brandon pretty soon about apple seed again right and it's a similar kind of synthetic robot human thing yeah uh, and and uh you know jumping time like this sort of gives me the impression that this is essentially like a dry run for the full arc of phoenix uh we've talked a little mm -hmm. bit about how he worked on phoenix for decades and it goes back and forth between the past and the, and the future and uh, this has got a similar kind of thing happening, but in a much more compressed time frame. Um, I, I think that, you know, like he, he tried out a lot of ideas as he's going, and this is a very similar to some of the future segments of Phoenix. Uh, when but was yeah, the, the first Phoenix. When was the first Phoenix? Yeah. When did he do Well, that? he did a, a really early uh, attempt at it in like 1954, uh, but the volume that we read, I believe, was 19. 60 i think well, that so ten, that would have predated this right but he he kept on working on and on and off so okay. you know he he was working on the last volume of phoenix while when he died i mean that's mm -hmm. why it's the last volume but uh, yeah <laughs> um so i mean j just because yeah i, I think that I'm, what i'm saying is that this might be a, a you know he's either using those same things or he's sort of uh feeling out what it would be like to have them all in the same story as opposed to jumping from volume to volume yeah um, i have i mean i have a feeling though also like he did so much stuff that we probably haven't seen i have a feeling right. that if we were familiar with all of his work it'd be like oh this is kind of just things that he cycled around on i'll admit i like him the least when he's doing science fiction i don't know what it is his science fiction ideas are always just too goofy or well, something always visual always visually the most dated too because uh, of course, yeah. looking at the future, uh, imagining the future just basically means looking around at what other people are thinking about the future. And so those things always date rather quickly. But the the concept here with the queen who can't be killed uh, is is really compelling. As far as a story segment, I found that to be the most uh, compelling probably of all the ones that are, you know, the episodic things in the book. Yeah, because basically she's like just transferring her brain from synthetic clone to synthetic clone i like this panel right here too where he's sticking his finger in his mouth he's right. reaching and he's got a a bomb hidden in his teeth and uh so he's got to go like infiltrate and get to the queen who is that same deity the the woman who's training him to run she has the same little hair swoop um and he very quickly works his way into and the fact all these head all these severed heads which is like the the brains um and then this is again kind of reminds me i know ink all came later but reminds me of the ink all where john the fool gets in and gets to be sexy right. with the queen yeah but both obviously coming from the sort of insect realm yeah uh, where the queen is serviced by many you know slaves who are going to and go uh, up on this special dick bed <laughs> right and uh she she's basically like show me love you're the human being i've i've selected here and you know he's he's uh first he's still gonna kill her um 
but then, you know, has a change of heart and ends up saving her from the exploding dick bed. Well, actually, before that, sorry, I forgot this. This yeah. seems crazy right here. I, I wanted to mention this. I forgot. She, she's, she's curious as a synthetic being about, um, like, we propagate in test tubes. I want to see you do it for real. Like, show me real <laughs> union of the sexes. I'm sure you know all this, don't you? There's the, I want to know the love. I want to see how humans produce offspring. And so she's like, do it for me right now. It's like, no, no, we're not going to do it. Like, no, the, I can't even do that. I don't like it. And, and then you, they get shocked if they don't do it. And this seems, again, one of those brutal, like against his cute cartooning. You're having this woman basically like, I don't, what, what would you even call this? It's, it's like not rape tech. Uh, it, it is, yeah. but it's not, it's. They're being held bizarre. against their will in order to do. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's an intense thing. Uh, very similar to the uh, Vonnegut book um, Fahrenheit. Wait, wait, what is the name of the book where the, the Kurt Vonnegut book where they're a prisoner in a zoo, essentially. Um, oh, uh, I, there's, they just made a comic of that, that I have, and I'm uh, blanking on it. <laughs> um yeah i know what you're talking about but yeah it burns this burns this girl and then it's like okay well now now you're gonna do it to me because yeah, nothing puts you in the mood like having somebody totally you know s turned into a cinder in front of you i like this psychedelic uh yeah fill in well, there and it's like her mechanical it's kind of like psychedelic but it's also supposed to be like her mechanicalness i think her right syntheticness uh he she doesn't have genitals but she's still trying to seduce him and so she eventually goes and gets a a version of herself made with genitals right <laughs> and that's when you really see that she's actually the same face and the same sort of you know configuration as that woman uh, he hides his tooth bomb <laughs> under her pillow and then last minute decides to save her the the sort of procedural stuff is interesting to see it thrown in with everything else where he's just like, I'm going to explain to you how you get made from a, a single cell or a hand. Uh, I'm going to explain how the tooth bomb works. You know, he like <laughs> Well, and also like a history lesson in 1964, the American scientist, Dr. F.C. Stewart made it known that, you know, that's right. like the history of cloning. Uh, it's, it's just such a strange mix. I was expecting this book, honestly, to be more serious we're going to read another one soon um ode to kirahito which is the first tezuka book i read which out of everything that i've read of his is the most focused and serious because apollo song is kind of seen up there with like the the peak of his work you know it's the ones that you hear talked about i was expecting this book to be more focused and serious and those kind of things really still just throw me for a loop yeah, I mean, it's such a wild book, though. I mean, I, I think it's huge, you know, really worth the worth the read. But yeah, it doesn't it's not like something that holds together as a, you know, it's hard to imagine somebody would just make this in isolation exactly how it is. It's it is what it is. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I like that reveal there and his his facial expression, just like I'm going to have to do what now? <laughs> He's like <laughs> synthetic vagina. <laughs> But yeah, she's she's he's uh, so judgmental. What a sculpture, yeah. What a synthophobe. So he's got this uh this there's the there's the ex-boyfriend has been recast um as the queen's advisor. He got the same hair and basic structure and everything. Look at his little devil hooves. I just noticed that. Yeah, it's With fantastic. The hair. His shoes his shoes make him look like devil hooves. That's cool. And his his uh, little hair cow licks look like horns. Yeah, but he's got the facial that, structure yeah. of the of the real life boyfriend. Um, and basically they're like, well, you know, Queen, you can't do what you want. We're gonna clone you again and uh, control you and be genitalless. You will have the ugliest head we can make for you. <laughs> yeah, that way he can't he, he won't be interested in humping on your genitals because you're gonna have an ugly right. face. <laughs> it's such a crazy story like i feel so stupid explaining this uh oh no it's great uh yeah i mean it's just he you know he just does what he, he does what he wants um it's it's a it's a performance you know 
but it's like so unique because of that too yeah. like it so like that you just passed right by an idea that would be the this would be an idea for an entire book by another yeah. person the idea that they sheared off one half of the mountain <laughs> so that they could live where it was you know yeah you could take that as the <laughs> nugget for like yeah, like that's the premise around which you world build for sure. Yep. And he just passes it right by, you know, and there's the Cynthian world. Take a good look. They cut a mountain clear in half and wiped out every last tree, blade of grass and bug. No charm, no warmth. Look at their homes. <laughs> and then yep. we're on to something else, you know. The Mount Fuji is the flat space center. <laughs> and then we see that the implication there when we see the palace is that it's reminiscent of the of the temple of apollo oh okay i didn't catch that so i was just thinking justice league <laughs> and you and see the here's queens. all the cloned right. queens so they can control her however they want there's some more of that psychedelic stuff i just like that page yeah, that's the most 1970s page, a 1970 page that we've uh, seen so far, I think. That looks most like the Gekiga stuff to me, like especially, what's that, uh, Gogol 13 or whatever? Like those sure. kind of... Sure, yeah, um, Saito, Taiko Yeah, Saito. like the spy yeah. stuff, like it has that more action and the grime and stuff on it. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, that, that he, not, not so good at that stuff, but it's cool. Speedline. Yeah, I mean, that's like almost a Kirby <laughs> background there. Yeah, it's interesting. It felt different to me. It definitely felt like, I mean, he does it really well, but it feels like mm -hmm. him pushing himself out of his boundaries. And then he gets shocked by lightning. Well, no, that's, that's not him. This is, the, um, this is the next character. So we're back in the real world and we see these two um, lovers walking through the woods with a naked umbrella and intentionally getting shocked by lightning and he finds oh, yeah. him dead in the woods on one of his runs the boy is dead and the girl is still alive he hides the body you can see that he's like sympathetic to her but he, he's so irritated by her willingness to die and how she wants to continue to be dead you know yeah, this is <laughs> she throws him over the hill <laughs> so that he can't be found yeah yeah but then, um, of course, this is going to bite him again because he's still on the on the run. Uh, and he overhears her talking um, and basically her saying that she doesn't love him. And this is the trainer lady. Right. At this point, I kind of, I don't remember exactly. I know I read it but I got so lost in all the back and forth. And then the suicide pact. And then we're about to have the explanation for the Apollo um, myth. He's basically been cursed uh, to be in the same situation as Apollo. And you find out doctor that she's working with the doctor. Right. And that this whole like so if like she made this admission that she was training him to be a runner, but then that was all just part of his therapy in the end. Right. And so this this is the explanation. The doctor says, "Do you know the Greek myth about the girl Daphne? On the banks of the Thaliasus River in Greece, Daphne sat running her fingers through her hair. She was the loveliest maiden in the world. And basically, Apollo comes by. Even for a god, Apollo possessed great manliness." Uh, Beauty, manliness, and majesty. Many a youth and maiden became slaves to his charms, but he he knew he was in love for the first time. But Daphne, you know, runs away. Yeah, and he's be... basically he's basically advising the girl that's out there training him to pull the Daphne move, right? Right. Like, but... like go turn yourself into a tree, make yourself unavailable to him. Right. Uh, and the implication, though, is that this is the curse. He's been cursed with the curse of Apollo, that he's not going to be able to reach his Daphne ever. Okay. Um, and yeah, but the doctor's saying, yeah, be like Daphne. Yeah. <laughs> but that's literally the curse that he's under, is okay. that, you know, that will always be without, outside of his reach. 
but who's who's the goddess that he encounters it's not apollo it's some other yeah it, it's not deity. clear whether that's even a goddess or whether that's like apollo's servant somehow or like the temple priestess uh you know just because she's got the the headdress doesn't necessarily mean um that that's you know that's a that that's a god or goddess yeah it's just strange it's it was it started to get harder for me to follow and it has this typical thing i mean it actually does wrap up but it has a typical thing for me for tezuka where at the end it all goes kind of quick right like and and so he's he's trying to like land his point all of a sudden like he's been exploring a theme and then it's like okay it's time to wrap it up and then he's got to just like kind of over explain too quick or something um, right which once again i'd be really curious to know what the publication the schedule was and yeah everything but um, yeah it it definitely moves very fast uh all of a sudden <laughs> after being quite leisurely for a while yeah Hir- hiromi dies and he sticks her in a barrel <laughs> <laughs> and fills it with water well then you realize not until the the last minute what his actual plan was i don't know if you you know noticed that he like carved a gun like shape out of a out of a uh out of a stick and he's basically setting it up so that he will be suicide you know he'll be killed by the by the people yeah who where's that him. panel i noticed that he's he uh, he doesn't is, is he is he chewing it or he just kind of snaps off like a gun like right. yeah and then right there he's holding it um and whittles it with his teeth coming. <laughs> is that what he's doing yeah he's like uh, biting off the a portion of it so that it's the right shape <laughs> i thought he was just looking at it like yeah okay this is a gun. oh maybe <laughs> like like here's all the cops they're coming for me i got this dead girl no yeah. he's got his teeth out i think he's biting it into the shape he's biting <laughs> okay. the he's biting the uh biting the barrel down so that it's got the little sight on the end of it <laughs> oh okay yeah so it looks more he's uh, it's very obvious that he's gonna like suicide by cop right um with the aid of all these barrels yeah Yeah. barrels of gasoline and then comes out and oh it's gasoline okay so then Mm -hmm. they shoot at him and it blows up some cool explosions yeah and then he's not even dead and no, no peace in death he's right back oh great not you again where's hiromi i want hiromi did I die again? How many times do I have to die and be reborn before you're satisfied? Thou hast no, uh, no faith in love. For this, thou must undergo endless trials of love and suffer pain of love eternally. No, I've had enough. I've suffered plenty. And then here's the, here's the big kicker. Human beings have undergone such suffering for millennia, for aeons. That legacy shall, shall continue until man is no more. Until that day, thy trials shall continue. <laughs> yeah and he so he's like you have to bear the load of humanity maybe that's where it's like he is apollo bearing that load for humankind and then can i at least see hiromi one more time no you're never gonna see yeah her you'll see her again soon he says but in every era you'll be deprived of her and then yeah. that's just like the nature of male dividing or nature dividing us into male and female right which uh which you get an interesting idea that like he has found this philosophical uh combination between buddhism and uh and the sort of fated you know the idea of apollo being eternally deprived i don't know it's an interesting like sort of cross-pollination of uh you know spiritual ideas I just didn't know what he was trying to say in the end about like mankind under this curse and like the only way to solve it is with love, I think. And it, but then he makes this crazy statement, like the embryo is the mark of sincere love between man and woman, male and female, without that love, the history of the human race would have ended long ago. As long as the world exists, men, women, and the children they bear will repeat the endless drama day after today. But there's almost a suggestion in there that like, if you're not having sex with sincere love, then you can't make <laughs> a baby, right? Like the embryo is the mark of sincere love. Ah, uh, well, and, I, I, 
I think it's both more, simpler and more complex than that, though, because I think what he's actually saying, do you, do you know, have you ever heard XTC? Do you know XTC at all? The, the like, 80s? Yeah, uh, their, their next to last album, they have a song called uh, I Can't Own Her. Uh, and uh, uh, anybody listening to this, I would give you, uh, I, I would if you would do so, uh, listen to XTC's I Can't Own Her. And there's a there's several different lines in the song that are relevant. Uh, basically, the whole song is relevant to this book. But the basic concept of the song is like looking at a person that you cherish and realizing that you can't actually have them. You can't possess them. And that there's something like horrible about that at the same time that it's completely natural. I think that that's what it's getting at here is that you, you, you're, you are Apollo. Everybody is Apollo in the sense that you don't ever actually reach the moment that you're looking for, that the, that the union of, mm. of sex is not complete in that sense that like you 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 think what you're trying to do is like merge yourself back into one person almost but yeah. you're actually by by nature separated um and that only in the embryo can you for real merge okay that makes more sense maybe it's a translation issue too yeah the the, the text was i mean I, i'm sorry to say really i i, I yeah, having having just adapted two books out of another language, uh, I've I've got this sort of fresh in my mind here. Um, what it takes to sort of push something into, you know, natural readability and sort of that being the real goal. Uh, I didn't yeah. feel it was a particularly natural text adaptation, but yeah, I think that that's the I think that that's the the real core of the book is that yeah, you can't own her. You know, uh, you you might be thinking that that's what the the actual merging only really happens um with having a kid and you know frankly i mean you know as a person who had has now you know i've got two kids um i i really there's something about that that seems true to me and there's something weird it's kind of uncanny sometimes when you look at your kid and you like see their thought process and you realize that like they are having similar experiences to what you have. It's almost like looking at a video of yourself where you, you have some kind of identification with them, but you don't have the sort of internal, you're, you're not thinking what you're thinking. You're just sort of seeing yeah. the thoughts pass on your face, you know? Um, and uh, I don't know, I, I, something about that is very compelling to me uh, as, as a sort of like philosophical argument being set out by the book yeah i guess not having had kids you know like jack is like stepson mm -hmm. but not having a kid that's actually genetically mine maybe some of that's lost on me yeah like like the even the impulse and imperative to have kids is completely lost on me like i don't it seems like a crazy thing to me that you've got this natural biological like I need to make more of me or as a human, like the human race, like we, we need to keep surviving. We need to make sure the planet's livable. Like in my mind, it's like the best thing we could do is I'll just quit having kids and party for 102 years <laughs> until the last one of us dies. And you know, like that's the solution to all the problems there. I don't feel that urge. I mean, I've definitely had like sexual experiences where like their arms or my arms for like five seconds you know and it's like wait i'm touching my own back like like this right. is strange but those are so rare and it is like a peak experience and like it's so fleeting and then you could you could chase that forever but like you're right. gonna be dissatisfied um yeah it, like it's weird i mean I'm, I'm not you know i'm not gonna try to persuade somebody to have i think if you don't want to have kids that's that's excellent go ahead and follow the thing that you don't want to do uh, cause you know, doing something you don't want to do is a recipe for disaster, uh, especially when it comes to other human beings. Uh, but you know, I definitely, the first time I ever even had a desire for something like that was when I had met my, you know, my wife, Rachel, uh, and I never would have even considered that prior to that. And so for me, it was just like meeting the right person. It was like instantly like scary instant, like very early in our relationship instant where we were like playing music. And I looked over and saw a little kid uh listening to us and dancing and i was like oh right <laughs> that's a thing we could we could do that <laughs> you know <laughs>
And yeah. um, go ahead. Yeah, it's just uh, you know, I, I think that sometimes maybe it's circumstance, or sometimes maybe it's just sort of general. You know, I mean, Maslow's hierarchy. You're not going to be thinking about having kids if you you don't have nourishment. Uh, you know. Yeah. I, I think that there's a certain level of things that probably need to be fulfilled before that's like on your on your list <laughs> i mean it, it manifests for me as like a curiosity like i look at me and tori and i think like like yeah i'm curious about what what a kid would be like right right you know and then i like look at the joy that we get out of just having dogs <laughs> and like right. that and i'm like well this could you know this could be yeah. so much more so i understand the instinct but I, I've also just admitted to myself very early on that like I'm just not I don't I don't have the I don't know I don't have that thing I would get irritated too easy I'm like too selfish I need too much time alone and so I get I get it, it for me it manifests purely almost as curiosity which is probably a bit sad but I'd, I'd uh, rather admit that I'm probably not capable or not not the right guy because <laughs> The, the other way that I think about it is like this whole like life is precious to me. It seems like an inherent obvious thing to most people. And to me, it's just it's like giving someone life is as morally questionable to me as taking a life because mm -hmm. you're committing someone to 80, 80 some odd years probably of like everything that goes into life without their permission. Mm -hmm. And it's like, fuck, if you do that, like like you owe them everything in terms of making sure that goes as well as possible. And if I don't feel up to that, then like, hell no, am I going to take on that moral responsibility? Yeah. You're, you're giving them the curse of Apollo. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Good place to end it. We'll leave yeah. it there. Sorry it, everybody that... for the depressing. Ending. <laughs> it's, it's a depressing book though. <laughs> it's, this is a heavy book for such a light, you know, uh, light, breezy action sequences and such. I mean, I, I, it's it's something else. Um, I I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know who I'd recommend it to. Uh, to though. I mean, if, obviously, if you watched the end of the video, you should probably buy it and, uh, or at least check it out from the library and read it. Um, but um, it, it's not like an easy recommend for a lot of people because I think it would be fairly upsetting for a lot of people. Probably a lot of people wouldn't get past the the early sequence, but um, with the you know animal killing and stuff like that well and just the like jerky nature of it i think and all the genre play and stuff distracted me from the core even though it's like necessary to his core message his winging it nature just right like leaves me unsettled and it's hard like even when we're going through it i'm like man i just read this but i'm having a hard time remembering <laughs> what exactly is going on here because I was just jerked around so much. So for that reason, it's a little hard to recommend it too, because it is an interesting, thoughtful book, but it's also, as a lot yeah. of his stuff is for me, kind of a frustrating reading experience where I don't fully, I guess it's hard for me to get to the core of what he's talking about because his method disrupts my trust in him. Mm -hmm. Like I don't, it feels like he doesn't know exactly where he's going, which is maybe good when you're exploring a theme, but like you don't have an end answer, but he seems to have an end answer, but then be jerky in how he's getting there. So it doesn't have that like thematic exploration. And I don't know, there's a weird friction there with a lot of his work work for me. So I'm really curious when we get to Ode to Kirihito, how, how you respond to that. Cause that's the first Tezuka I read. And then I've seen everything else, which seems to be more typical and that other one's less typical yeah. now, I think. I, I think we'll definitely do that. We'll probably do another volume of Phoenix um, and maybe yeah. even skip around in that. And we should definitely do MW at some point too, which is the more extreme uh, Gekiga uh, response okay. <laughs> book cool. that's available in English. But um, nice talking uh, to you, Carson. And um, if you guys are looking for a book that is also uh, really good, but uh, sometimes difficult to recommend. Uh, let me take a look at uh, The Strange Death of Alex Raymond, which I love. Um, and uh, I think it's a fantastic, uh, very dense read and um, very entertaining and some really uh, formally innovative stuff. And was recently nominated for an Eisner Award. 
we can uh, say that now because like we're <laughs> recording this after it got announced so we're for sure yeah we we got uh an eisner nod for best reality based work which uh the it's work great. is definitely based in reality but i think a lot of people are kind of giggling <laughs> at it because because it, <laughs> of some of the stranger aspects that come in later in the book i I saw a comment. Somebody said reality with extra sprinkles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's pretty. That's a good way to describe it. It's based on um, reality, but it expands up to uh, the metaphysical suppositions. And it's a right. wild book. But it, now it, it Eisner a, nominated. So, you know, yeah. it's like at the end of the year, you got to go watch all the Oscar nods right now. You got to yeah. you, you have to go buy Strange Death. If you have to. It's true. You're basically compelled yeah, by hear, hearing this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, by the time you're watching this, because we are recording ahead in advance here so that um, uh, my family's moving and I'm going to be gone for a couple of weeks doing that. Um, but by the time you're watching this, uh, there should be a Kickstarter live for another quite wild book, um, Yokoyama Yuichi's Plaza. So hopefully we'll have a link there um, during when we're running stuff during the Kickstarter. You'll have a link there and we really would like it if you guys would check that out and support the book. Um, it's going to be a great one and uh, some really interesting stuff that we've got going on with the Kickstarter. So please go check that out. And if um, the Eisners have any taste, it will be on the best Japanese translated <laughs> list next year. Because this year it's all like Chainsaw Man and a bunch <laughs> of stupid shit. So <laughs> next year, Plaza, we're saying it now. Eisners, pay attention to it. It's going to hey. be an amazing book. I hope it's a head to head competition between uh, Plaza and whatever the most recent um, volume of uh, Fist of the North Star is. Because that <laughs> would be a real award ceremony. And I hope that Ken, someone shows up as Ken in costume and uh, I can show up as a, a sound effect. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, what do you, a speed line and a sound effect? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, take care, guys. Make sure to like, smash that subscribe button, and ring that bell.